perfect. So please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for inviting me for this uh, to this wonderful conference. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about crossing symmetric dispersion relations and EFT bounds. And so this is a kind of going to be somewhat orthogonal to most of the talks that you've heard so far, but uh, it'll tie up uh, very intriguingly uh, with uh, what you've heard so far, I think. So here is an outline of my talk. So I'm going to first uh, describe to you crossing symmetric dispersion relations because this may not be very familiar to most of you. And then I'm going to talk about locality constraints, which are basically uh, uh, the equi equivalent uh, conditions for the what are called the null constraints in the fixed dispersion relations. Um, and then uh, I'm going to introduce geometric function theory, which uh, I believe is a beautiful area of mathematics, which the crossing symmetric dispersion relations capture very nicely. And uh, there are theorems in this geometric function theory uh, by the name of the Bieber back conjecture, uh, which uh, provide two sided bounds on Wilson coefficients. Um, and also, they provide two sided bounds on the amplitude themselves. So, we will talk uh, a bit about that. Um, then I will uh, briefly mention about weak low spin dominance, uh, which was introduced by uh, uh, Zvi, Sasha, and Dimitrios. And uh, uh, finally, I don't know how much time I'll have, uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, in the end about generalization to external spins. Um, so let's uh, begin with an invitation because uh, this uh, story may not be familiar to most of you. Uh, so let's uh, consider the numerical pion bootstrap and uh, examine how the uh, statement about uh, the Bieberbach conjecture in mathematics arises in the pion bootstrap. So let's consider the low energy expansion of uh, pi zero pi zero going to pi zero pi zero amplitude in QCD. And so this is a massive uh, theory. Uh, so we are uh, imagining that uh, we are in the cut complex S plane where uh, uh, the, the cut starts from S equal to four M square. And we can expand the amplitude uh, in the following manner. Uh, so, uh, uh, so so uh, S, S1, S2 and S3 are basically shifted Mendel's time variables, the shift uh, is uh, uh, via four by three m square, which is the crossing symmetric point, and the coefficients uh, of uh, the quadratic invariant raised to some power and cubic raise, uh, invariant raised to some power um, is what I'll call the Wilson coefficient. Um, and uh, also, just to remind you, uh, s one plus s two plus s three is equal to zero in these conventions. So, just to um, uh, in, in my notation, the first entry for the Wilson coefficient will correspond to the power of x, which is the quadratic invariant, and the second entry is going to correspond to the power of y, which is the cubic invariant. Uh, now, um, a, uh, a couple of years back, uh, Andrea, Joao, and uh, 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 Pedro taught us how to play around with uh, numerical uh, S matrix bootstrap pertaining to pions. And so this implements uh, uh, pion S matrix bootstrap constraints, uh, the nonlinear constraints uh, that follow from unitarity. And so uh, we just tweaked uh, that uh, program a little bit, and we got a huge space of very interesting S matrices, which we dubbed as the river. Uh, so it's not very important to know what these are, just to, know, uh, just, uh, uh, to note that we have a, a large class of interesting uh, pi on S matrices. And uh, so here uh, on these plots, what I've done is I've taken uh, specific combinations, linear combinations of the Wilson coefficients. So A is the parameter. So here uh, I will introduce A in a bit, but uh, for the purpose of this slide, A is just a parameter. It's a dial that dials between minus eight by nine and 16 by nine. These numbers uh, may not mean anything to you, but uh, I'll explain where these numbers come from later on. And uh, so alpha one is uh, a combination of the first order Wilson coefficients. Alpha two is a combi linear combination of the second order Wilson coefficients. Alpha three is a combination of the uh, third order Wilson coefficients and so on. Now, if you take the ratio uh, of these alpha two and alpha one and plot them, you will see that they uh, apparently are bounded by uh, very nice numbers. Uh, in particular, it seems like they are bounded between minus two and two. And this alpha three uh, divided by alpha one is bounded between minus one and three. And what I'm going to tell you is that these bounds are what follow from uh, the Bieberbach conjecture in, in mathematics. Uh, 
So um, I will frequently use this convention where m squared is equal to one. So uh, a bit more familiar uh, would be uh, a plot like this, where I would extract uh, uh, the ratio of Wilson coefficients from the S matrix bootstrap data and plot them. And uh, I would see that this ratio is again, bounded on both sides. Now, uh, uh, there are uh, some ACE matrices which seem to saturate the upper bound, 9 by 8, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this minus 9 by 16, which I'll be able to derive for you analytically, uh, there are, uh, we have not been able to locate an S matrix which saturates this, but nonetheless, uh, this is going to be the bound that comes from uh, the geometric function theory constraints. Um, so this uh, talk is going to be based on some work that we've been doing, uh, largely motivated by uh, uh, resurgence of interest in this uh, uh, dispersion relation way of deriving bounds. Uh, so a lot of these papers and a lot of these uh, talks you've heard of already. Uh, so I should mention uh, this first paper that was written with Ahmadullah Zahed at the end of last year. And then a couple of follow-up papers, uh, one written with my graduate student Parthiv Haldar uh, and Ahmadullah. So Parthiv is going to be in the job market this year. And then there was a follow-up paper where we clarified the situation with geometric function theory, which I wrote with my uh, postdoc Prashant Raman, who is there in the audience. Um, uh, the, there's, a fall, uh, there's, there's an ongoing work which uh, discusses this in the context of uh, uh, scattering of identical particles carrying spin with uh, Shubham, who is a postdoc in uh, Chicago, Koshik, who is a postdoc in, uh, in ENS in France, uh, Parthi, who is my graduate student, and Prashant, who is my postdoc. So let me begin by uh, telling you uh, 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 briefly about crossing symmetric dispersion relations. And the uh, slogan is that uh, you have to remember that uh, this needs a different set of variables uh, other than the Mandelstam variables. So uh, this does not need uh, much emphasis, but uh, just to set notations clear, you have heard about the fixed T dispersion relation. So this is something that uh, we write down, we assume two subtractions. And the absorptive part has a partial wave expansion. Most of the time, we uh, focus on the partial wave expansion uh, with the, uh, uh, these ALs positive. And uh, the Legendre polynomials or the Gegenbauer polynomials, uh, the arguments are uh, cos theta. And we actually, uh, most of the time, we expand in the forward limit. Uh, one, uh, one important place where we're going to differ is that we are not going to just be interested in the forward limit, but rather we're going to be interested in unphysical values of t, which will correspond to t bigger than zero. Now, this, was, this will correspond to uh, um, uh, the enlarged Martha domain, uh, which allows for, uh, at least in the massive case, which allows for t to be slightly positive. And in this uh, context, crossing symmetry is imposed as a constraint, uh, which are called null constraints. Now, uh, the crossing symmetric dispersion relation is not new. It was uh, introduced in 1972 in a relatively unknown paper by Oberson and Puri. And this is a very beautiful paper so far as mathematical physics is concerned. Unfortunately, if you open this, uh, most of the equations are going to be very unfamiliar to you. And in fact, we struggled with this equation, uh, the, with this paper a lot, uh, because the most useful equation was in a note added in the proof. And I will uh, tell you what this uh, what this equation is. So the key steps in deriving a crossing symmetric dispersion relation is that rather than holding t fixed, we hold uh, the ratio of this cubic Mandelstam invariant to the quadratic Mandelstam invariant, which I'll call y divided by x. We hold uh, this fixed. Uh, and we can parameterize the solution to this equation using a new variable, complex variable z. Uh, we, and, and the S's, the S1, S2, and S3 here are written in terms of this parameter A and in terms of the complex variable Z like so. Here in this equation, ZK is a cube root of unity. And it is particularly useful because S1 plus S2 plus S3 is equal to zero by uh, the convention. This is the analog of S plus T plus U equal to 4M squared. Uh, Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 is also equal to zero because that's the property, that's the property that the cube roots of unity satisfy. Now, what this does is that instead of the usual uh, complex S plane, we have a complex Z plane where the, uh, uh, the three channel cuts are mapped uh, to the uh, two specific portions of the arcs, which are on the boundary of a unit disk. Um, 
And so the key features to remember so far as this plot is concerned uh, is that uh, if you are interested in low energy expansion, that would correspond to expanding around the origin. Whereas if you're interested in the regi limit, it would correspond to taking uh, Z uh, to, the, to one of the roots of unity. So the key idea is to write a dispersion relation in Z for fixed A uh, and uh, a couple of co convenient algebraic points. So if you look at the cubic invariant in terms of this uh, complex variable Z, it takes on a very simple form. It takes on uh, a form that is uh, proportional to this parameter that we are holding fixed A cubed times Z cubed over Z cubed minus one squared. And X also has a similar form. And I would urge you to make a mental note of these forms because in the context of geometric function theory, these are what are called Kobe functions, and these are extremal functions. They actually extremize the Bieber back bounds. Uh, and uh, th this will play a, an interesting role later on in my talk. The other point to note is that if you have full three channel crossing symmetry, the expansion is only going to involve Z cubed. So frequently we are going to make use of this notation Z tilde, which is Z cubed. So this is the crossing symmetric dispersion relation. So I will spend a couple of minutes uh, uh, explaining what the uh, this this formula is. So you have uh, the amplitude on the left hand side, and it is an integral which involves the absorptive part. There is some uh, integration variable. Now, ordinarily, uh, when you have the absorptive part, you would see uh, you would think that uh, the argument is going to be t. But in this particular case, the argument is a little weird. It is a, uh, it is some function s two plus. The S2 plus here is, it looks a little complicated, but uh, it's not. Uh, one can um, understand why this uh, uh, this form arises. It's because uh, we are holding A fixed, and if we substitute S3 to be minus S1 minus S2, then this becomes a quadratic equation, and S2 plus is one of the solutions to the quadratic equation. Uh, so that is why you see this form. H here is a kernel, so H almost looks like as if it's some uh, phi cube theory, some uh, some something that you would be would would be familiar in a phi cube theory. It's al almost that, except that it is dressed by this uh, extra factor s one sitting in the numerator, and that's because we have assumed uh, two subtractions while writing down this dispersion relation. So this is manifestly crossing symmetric. Uh, why? Because the uh, s one s two s three, of course, the kernel is manifestly crossing symmetric here. Uh, the only other place that S1, S2, S3 enters is via this variable A, and A is, of course, again, manifestly crossing symmetric. So this uh, might seem a little strange that we have this com complicated dependence instead of uh, the familiar dependence that you see for T, you'll have this complicated dependence on S2+. Plus. And that plays a key role in my talk. So one thing to notice is that if I write down the partial wave expansion for the absorptive part, I would see basically powers of this this object here, because one plus two s over t is basically going to be just this guy here, and if I do a Taylor expansion around a equal to zero, I'm going to pick up arbitrary powers of a to the n at each spin, and powers of a to the n are problematic simply because uh, they look like y by x, and if I, if I have arbitrary powers of y by x to the power n. That would be uh, problematic because there are no such powers on the left hand side. And this is what gives rise to what are called locality constraints. And these locality constraints are nothing but the null constraints uh, that uh, you're familiar with in the fixed T dispersion relation. So the null constraints are basically linear combination of these locality constraints. So these locality constraints are getting rid of these non local terms, the arbit these, these negative powers of X's that we see at each order in the partial wave expansion, which are absent in a local theory. So, um, so the lesson is that to have a crossing symmetric expansion, we have to introduce spurious non-local singularities, uh, spin-wise, uh, to the basis elements. And this, this is what gives rise to locality constraints or the null constraints. So um, le let me now talk about uh, geometric function theory, because in this crossing symmetric dispersion relation, these two-sided bounds will arise due to well-known math theorems in, in, in geometric function theory. And uh, nicely, this has the acronym GFT, uh, like QFT and EFT. Uh, 
So um, uh, a couple of points uh, just to just emphasize, just to remind you is that we, we are expanding, we are doing a Taylor expansion uh, of the amplitude. And if we don't impose these locality constraints, there would be these negative powers of X's. Um, we can rewrite this expansion in terms of the this variable Z. I told you that in, in my language or in, in the processing symmetric language, Z is a more natural variable or Z tilde is a more natural variable. And we will get some uh, combinations of the Wilson coefficients as the coefficients of uh, each power of Z. So there's some uh, formula that you can work out. Uh, you can work out very explicitly what alpha one is in here. It looks like so, so W10 times some uh, A times this ratio plus one. If we don't impose locality, we'll also get uh, a linear combination of these locality constraints which of course vanished for a local theory. Uh, and explicit closed form expressions for each of these uh, or arbitrary uh, of these locali arbitrary locality constraints or null constraints exist. And these are given in terms of Jacobi polynomials. And that is uh, that explains why I was considering these ratios. These ratios are just motivated by uh, what arises in the Taylor expansion coefficient when you rewrite it in terms of Z and A. So A is the parameter that we're holding fixed while writing down this crossing symmetric dispersion relation. So what is the magic of the Z variable? So one magic is that you will see that in terms of Z, the amplitude M can be written in terms of an integral over some measure factor, some positive measure factor, times uh, some very uh, nice looking uh, kernel. And in the mathematics literature, this kind of a represent rep representation is what is called a Robertson representation. And it's a Robertson representation for a special class of mathematics functions, which are called typically real functions. So the amplitude is basically uh, going to be uh, in, in a suitable domain, uh, what is in mathematics called a typically real function. And the measure factor is given in terms of the absorptive part. So in order to get a positive measure factor, you require a positive absorptive part. So uh, let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about the math history. So if you have uh, what are called univalent functions uh, of a single variable uh, inside the unit disk, then uh, these univalent functions are basically injective functions. So f of z1 is equal to f of z2 only if z1 is equal to z2. Then uh, you can do a Taylor expansion of this uh, function. And in 1916, Ludwig Bieberbach who was a Nazi mathematician, conjectured that the absolute value of an should be less than or equal to n. And this is called the Bieber-Bach conjecture. Now, the most general version, uh, there are subclasses that can be proved for uh, some subclasses of functions, but the most general version uh, was proved by Louis de Branges in 1985, uh, which was uh, almost 70 years after the original conjecture was made. Now the subclass of these functions, which uh, also has uh, uh, something like a, a, the Bieber-Bach bounds, are what are called typically real functions. And these typically real functions are defined by this equation here, the imaginary part of f of z times the imaginary part of z is bigger than zero. And in fact, proving the Bieber-Bach conjecture for this class is easy. And this was done by Rogosinski in 1932. And this is reviewed in uh, this paper that I wrote with Prashant as well. Now, curiously, in physics, uh, these typically real functions were introduced by Wigner in 1951. Um, unfortunately, Wigner's paper was published in a journal of mathematics, so I don't think this paper is that well known. So uh, using this uh, uh, representation, Robertson representation, we can now address the question, what coefficients are two-sided bounded? And what is the theorem, what is the math theorem that guarantees that these two-sided bounds exist? The math theorem in question is going to be what is called the Markov brothers inequality. And uh, uh, this is an inequality that was proved by the less famous Markov brother in 1890. So the answer to this question is that any function which admits this Robertson representation with the positive measure factor inside the unit disk and for A between some minus A min to A max admits two-sided bounds on, on a linear combination of the Wilson coefficients. And these bounds are what I would like to call as the Bieber-Bach-Rogosinski bounds. Uh, 
Uh, I will explicitly mention this bounds in, in the next slide or so. And Markov Brothers and Equality then guarantees two-sided bounds on the ratios of these Wilson coefficients. Anindra, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So what are these bieberbach rogosinski bounds? So this, on, this person on the left is Ludwig Bieberbach. Uh, and as I told you, uh, he was a Nazi mathematician. And this person on the right is uh, uh, Rogozinski. I think his first name was Werner, I have forgotten, but... Uh, and uh, there's a very, uh, very interesting mathematics history behind this because uh, Bieberbach was a Nazi mathematician and he, and he was instrumental in driving out Jewish physicists and Jewish mathematicians from Germany. Rogosinski happened to be a Jewish mathematician and uh, he was unfortunately, he had to leave and uh, ironically, uh, he uh, proved the uh, the typically real version of the Bieberbach conjecture um, while still in Germany. So the statement about these Bieberbach Rogosinski bounds is that if f of z is typically real inside the unit disk, which means that it satisfies this condition like so, then the Taylor expansion coefficient for this function are two-sided bounded. And it's almost similar to what Bieberbach had conjectured in 1916, except that for the odd coefficients, a3, a5, etc., the lower bound is a bit stronger. Uh, so for example, for a3, instead of getting minus 3, you get minus 1 as the lower bound. And uh, so here, let me introduce uh, another curious fact. So once you have these bounds, uh, you uh, mathematicians are interested in knowing what kind of functions actually saturate these bounds. So for example, what kind of function f of z would actually saturate n? And the answer is that these are these Kobe extremal functions, z over z minus one square. Now, these class of typically real functions also satisfy, satisfy or give rise to certain nonlinear conditions. And they translate into nonlinear conditions on the Wilson coefficients as well. Some of these conditions are very easy to write down. Uh, they, they are basically the cauchy schwarz inequalities. Uh, but these nonlinear conditions are arise from the Toeplitz determinant positivity, and I don't have time to explain this. And uh, they arise from something called the trigonometric moment problem. So let me give you an example of a two-sided bound. And uh, this is quite simple to prove in the context of pion scattering. And it's also uh, simple to prove in, in the context of effective field theory. For example, in, in the kind of work that uh, Simon and uh, Van Duong would do. So you take alpha 1. Uh, it has a simple expression. So this, uh, uh, this is supposed to be true. This inequality here, less than 0, is supposed to be true for, in order to have a positive measure. And this is supposed to be true for all values of a that lie between minus a min and a max. And that is what is the power of this inequality. If this was true only for one value of a, it wouldn't be powerful. So the first thing to realize is that if you do a Taylor expansion of this inequality around a equal to zero, you immediately see that this would be the leading term and that would translate into w10 being bigger than zero. There are similar inequalities which actually give rise to the fact that wn0 is bigger than zero. And uh, the fact that this inequality has to hold uh, in this range uh, immediately translates into the fact that w01 by w10 has to be two-sided bounded. And analytically, you can actually show that the two-sided bounds are minus 9 by 16 to 9 by 8, which are the lines that I showed you from the, uh, uh, the pi on S matrix bootstrap bound. I should tell you that the same result, precisely uh, the, de the decimal equivalent, you can match up to some uh, very high order of uh, decimals on both sides, arise in modifying uh, Simon's and Van Duong's uh, uh, SGPP programming. You can actually do it using linear programming by discretizing S1 on Mathematica. We have some code that does this very easily. Uh, and to modify this to massive theories, uh, because the, 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 the partial wave expansion that they use was for, for massless uh, effective field theories. So I was telling you about this Markov brothers inequality, which guarantees two-sided bounds. The Markov brothers inequality is actually tells you that if you have a polynomial, which is actually similar to the kind of expansion that we have here, and if this real polynomial of degree at most n is bounded in some range of x, then each of these coefficients, the absolute value of each of these coefficients is also bounded, and it's known what the, what the bounds are. So this actually gives rise to a completely general statement 
uh, that the ratio of WPQ over W10 should be less than 5.625. So here, of course, I've used M square equal to one. This is for pion scattering. So this is a massive theory. So uh, just to say that for this theory, we, we can uh, show this. There are also uh, some things called distortion bounds, which actually bound the amplitude itself, and it gives you bounds on both sides. Uh, and there's a theorem uh, from 1965 due to Goodman, which uh, can be translated into a bound, a two-sided bound on the uh, on the amplitude. It gives rise to something like a Frossard-like bound, an upper bound. Uh, we should not perhaps be su surprised at this because we, after all, assumed uh, two subtractions when we wrote down this dispersion relation. But the form is uh, kind of intriguing. It's not really the Frossard bound. And on the lower side, we have something like the cellulose Martin bound. Again, uh, it's not quite the cellulose Martin bound, but it, it, it is reminiscent of that. So um, I said that these extremal functions, the Kobe functions, are going to play an important role. So let me tell you a cute observation. So these extremal functions are extremal because if you do a Taylor expansion on z equal to zero, you can see that uh, very easily in, in your mind that uh, the coefficients are two, three, etc., which are which saturate the upper uh, uh, the upper bound of these buber back over Swinsky bounds. And each of these x's, so x was the quadratic uh, Mandel's time invariant, and y, y was the cubic Mandel's time invariant, look like these Kobe functions themselves. Now I told you that uh, negative powers of x are ruled out by locality. So if we wanted to construct functions which had simple poles. Then the extremal functions are x, y, and x squared by y. I mean, there, there is no other choice. This x squared by y is nothing but the tree level massless scalar scattering with the graviton exchange. And that's quite curious. So it's, uh, it's almost as if EFT is emerging from these extremal function considerations in GFT. So, uh, so, so far we have talked about massive theories where the cuts uh, on the complex S plane started from s equal to 4m squared. But also for weakly coupled effective field theories, uh, the story generalizes. There's one subtlety. The subtlety is that uh, we needed to find uh, regions in the A parameter space where the absorptive part was positive. And axiomatic theorems in, uh, um, uh, sorry, theorems in axiomatic quantum field theory told us what the, what, what the range of A was. In effective field theories, there are no such theorems. But we can still proceed, and this is uh, uh, taking inspiration out of the kind of work that Simon did, uh, we can proceed by allowing for adding a linear combination of these locality constraints to the crossing symmetric dispersion relations, because these locality constraints are basically adding zeros, and then dialing the parameter A to get some improved positivity. And you can determine this range of A, which gives rise to this positive absorptive part for effect effective field theories as well. When you do this, when you play this game and repeat the arguments that I showed you, the first few Wilson coefficients, you get exactly the same results as what Simon and Van Doom got. Let me comment about low spin dominance. So uh, in my in my story, the absorptive, the positivity of the absorptive part plays an important role. And the uh, if you look at the absorptive part, it is an expansion in terms of uh, the, the partial wave amplitudes times the Gegenbauer polynomials. And the partial wave amplitudes are bigger than zero. The Gegenbauer polynomials are positive only beyond some, uh, uh, some uh, they're generically positive if the argument is bigger than one. But for uh, depending on the spin, there is always some largest zero beyond which it's, it's positive. The statement that we know is that as spin goes to infinity, the largest zero goes to one. Now it turns out that when you play this game uh, in the scalar effective field theory, to determine where the absorptive part is positive, it translates into uh, a, a point uh, which is close to the spin two largest zero. So that is saying that spin two dominates, and if, if it did not, then the absorptive part would not be positive uh, because spin four would take over and so on. So uh, it's as if uh, there is some spin two dominance. And uh, I believe this relates to the uh, what is what uh, Sasha uh, um, um, Zvi and Dimitrios called the weak low spin dominance conjecture in their in their paper. Ninda, time to wrap up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm almost done. One minute. And uh, so there is some generalization to external spins. Uh, it works for external spins as well. And this actually 
builds on an idea that was given by Ross Keys in 1970. He actually told us that uh, you can expand any arbitrary function in terms of a crossing symmetric basis. And um, you can consider what uh, combinations of these uh, amplitudes give rise to a Robertson representation. Uh, and uh, then uh, apply the theorems from geometric function theory, and you, you will find that, uh, for example, here, the, this combination is going to be two-sided bounded, and this uh, agrees with the recent analysis by Hendrickson and company. We can also say that for parity violating terms like this, uh, these kind of techniques don't work, so we cannot bound the coefficient of this, uh, this kind of a term in an effective field theory. Uh, so yeah, so I uh, had some explicit formula, which I don't have time to explain, but this is the summary, so I'll leave it up there, uh, and thank you for listening, and sorry for slightly going over time. Thank you very much, Aninda. Uh, we maybe have a time for one short question, so someone from, from, from the audience, or on the chat. Um, so maybe... Maybe I'll ask a quick question. So uh, in, in, in Newton's talk, there was a story where you could derive the bound and, and then nicely impose null constraint as some geometric slice. Is there a way for your story where you forget about locality constraints, derive some yes. bound? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it is possible okay. to get that. You'll get a larger space and then these, these locality constraints will slice up the space. Indeed, in fact, I had a slice to, I had a cartoon to show that indeed that's exactly what happens. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the last speaker uh, 